thanks everybody for being here. I decided to talk today about emotion regulation and why, because emotions uh, is something that is always there, always in the background. And I think it's one of those things that is so common that we oftentimes don't think very much about it. They are attached to everything that we do and most of the things that we think. And for the purpose of psychiatric or mental health practice, talking about emotions is going to be very useful in my view because overly reactive or overly intense emotional experiences, as I'm sure you know, are very common chief complaints or very important coexisting complaints when we, when we engage in psychiatric or mental health practice. And people that experience intense or rapidly shifting or feel as if they have little control over their emotions um, can, they, they suffer quite a bit. They, they can be very distressing and they can lead to erratic or impulsive or the kinds of behaviors that people will oftentimes regret and behaviors that um, are largely driven by overreactive or overly intense emotions oftentimes um, will have consequences which can then create more emotional difficulties down the road. So it can create a cascade. And it's also, um, it comes frequently to our attention because medications by and large don't work all that well. You can certainly find some people with emotional reactivity issues that will benefit from some kinds of medicines, but um, it's difficult to have them generalize across a large population. And for many folks who try them, they, they have little benefit and sometimes lots of side effects. So thinking, thinking about emotions and talking about them, I, I, I hope to leave you with some insights uh, that will help you to better un understand the, the nature of the struggles and some tools for, for how to counsel people that, that have such difficulties. And I'm gonna to try to still uh, complete all this in as close to 15 minutes as I can. And we're going to talk about what I call the what and why of emotions. I'm going to do a, because this is going to be a short talk, I'm going to do a very high level or very um, simplistic summary of, of the neurobiology emotion. And then I'm going to discuss how, 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 we, how one can regulate emotions. So let's start with what are emotions? Emotions, um, I like to think of them as the way, as the name that we give to the feeling of your body. Um, certain kind of, emotions involve responses typically to um, situations, events, or to thoughts or to memories. They, they are attached to changes of blood pressure, pulse, um, the, uh, the, the amount of sweat that we produce, um, to a sensation of energy or, or lack of energy, um, or to alarm. They, 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 and all these, um, all these things that I described are, are neurobiological or neurophysiological processes they have a certain kind of feeling and, and we call them emotion. And uh, they, involve, they involve directing your attention to a thought, event, or a memory. Um, they involve uh, creating and assigning a valence or assigning an emotional meaning to something. And once you have noticed something and given it a, 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 a valence meaning, then you will have um, certain kinds of thoughts or feelings that, that contribute to the subjective experience of emotion. So um, it's a lot of words. That's why I say, I like to say it's the way that physiology feels. <laughs> and this is a point, this is a bit of a tangent, but this is extremely important from Shep's uh, paper. One thing the emotions are not are ballistic entities that must proceed to completion. Uh, once I feel angry, I don't have to take anger to some sort of endpoint. Emotions are not they're not, I love this word ballistic. And because they chose the word ballistic, then you have this quote here from Messamore um, that a suggestion, let's not ever use the word trigger in the setting of mental health practice. Trigger words are extremely important and even small metaphors have outsized impacts on the way that we think of people or people think about themselves. Um, so triggers are things that belong to guns. Things are th triggers are things that are passively activated and always result in explosions. Um, human beings are not that way, and emotions are not that way. I think when we, I, I think the idea of 
of telling somebody that they have a trigger started off as a way to try to um, to be nice um, or to be gentle and to acknowledge that it feels to the person that they don't have a lot of control over how their body or their emotion reacts. But when you say you were triggered or what is your trigger, you are giving this person or, um, or and yourself a, an unhelpful metaphor that, that suggests that they have no control um, over what the trigger is and what the the response is going to be so that's extremely disempowering and is a uh, is actually an unnecessary and unhelpful metaphor so they're not ballistic entities um, why do we have them um, essentially because for, for most things that human beings have they're associated with improving our survival um, emotions serve many functions they um, we human beings do not survive as solitary entities. We are hardwired to be social animals. We only survive in, in groups. Um, and so because we're in groups, we have, nature has endowed us with the need to have hierarchies and to, um, to, to signal to each other what's going on. So emotional ex emotions, many of them are attached to facial expressions or body language or changes of language intonation, which have a clear signal to other members in the group that something is going on with me if I'm demonstrating these outward signs of emotion. Um, we also have emotions as part of, of our human slash primate social hierarchy uh, mechanisms. So I, I, we are, we are, we have a capacity to feel shame um, and shame puts us in our place. Um, so th there's a, we could talk for many, many minutes about the, 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 the way that emotions can play in a social hierarchy. But one of the arguments why we have them and why sometimes they're unpleasant is because they serve that function. And uh, like, like physical pain, emotional pain can be a signal to us that we need to modulate our behaviors in some way. So all these things together um, eventually uh, contribute to greater success in human groups and greater survival of, of, of human groups and species. Let's talk about, uh, so we've talked about the how and the why and the what, let's talk about, um, well, let's talk about the how, the neurobiology of emotion. Again, this is a short talk. This is going to be a simplified, um, condensation of some neurobiology, but essentially emotions consist of thoughts, feelings, and what I call doing. And doing in this case, I'm referring to mostly the downstream physiological effects, like the feeling of heaviness, the secretion of stress hormones like cortisol, or the quickening of pulse or the slowing down of things. Um, but they can all, doing can also involve behavioral repertoires like screams or running away or making making advances or something like that um, and they consist emotions are broken down into situations that occur attention to situations the appraisal or the assignment of emotional valence um, and the response either the physiological or the behavioral response and re responses can change situations so that creates a kind of a loop um, here are the neuroanatomical structures um, what I, what I mess more term, thinking brain, uh, consists of dorsal, uh, dorsal structures and rostral structures. So uh, largely prefrontal cortex and areas within this, as well as portions of the cingulate cortex. Um, we have I call, what Messamore calls the emoting brain. So these are the parts of the brain that are involved in the generation of, or, or the assignment of valence. Like I'm, um, the amygdala, for example, gets input from, the all the senses and from the frontal cortex which is presenting the amygdala with some analysis of the situation amygdala then turns on or not uh feelings of anxiety or anger so the assignment of valence happens um in the bottom uh, and and these structures are also part of i think many people will have heard the limbic system so this is the emotion brain and the the emotion sections the emotion sections are attached to the thinking parts and to the association areas they're also attached to things like hypothalamus and the brainstem regions that will send the physiological response downstream so um and again physiological response will change attention and maybe the situation so these are these are the areas key point is that um 
these parts, the emotional brain, are connected to these parts, the thinking brain. And because of those connections, we have opportunities for intervening. So let's talk about how we can regulate emotion. Uh, you'll recognize this graph uh, or this figure. I showed this to you two slides ago. Um, and there are multiple stages as well as multiple neuroanatomical regions that are involved in, in this process. So at every stage, we have potential to modify. We can, if we're in a situation, we can change, we can remove ourselves from a situation or we can modify our environment. We can, we can, um, we can pay attention to what we're paying attention to and we can try to pay attention to other things. We can notice the interpretations that we're having. Oh no, here it goes again, I'm bound to fail. Um, or we could change that cognition script to, I'm in a situation that I don't like, um, I may or may not succeed, and if I don't succeed, I'm going to learn something, um, and so forth. I mean, there are many, many adaptations um, for how you can reframe a situation, and we can, choose, we can choose how to respond. We can say, I'm feeling, I have an emotion of anger, um, I feel like I want to yell at this person, but now that I've noticed that this is happening, I think I'm going to um, say something nice instead or say nothing at all instead. So um, we can intervene in all these steps um, and uh, practicing awareness of them. Uh, so, so, excuse me. Um, the most commonly used emotion regulation therapy is called dialectical behavior therapy. There are many others that ultimately involved that ultimately target emotion regulation. And they, they, they have these elements in common across all of them. Um, we teach clients about how, how emotions work, uh, letting them know along the way that there are many stages at which they could intervene. Uh, they all involve in one way or the other, whether they outright call it mindfulness or they use some other language. Um, they involve uh, developing a capacity to notice what's happening, notice when I'm feeling aroused, notice when I'm having certain kinds of ideas, um, notice when I'm in situations where bad things might happen. Um, and then they involve learning about alternate strategies and rehearsing them. Um, and the more you practice, notice, the more you develop the ability to notice what's going on, and the more you practice um, strategies to change your responses to what's going on, uh, the more likely you are to succeed. Um, not only succeed, but as I'm gonna show you now, you're likely to literally reshape how your brain functions. So here's, I'm gonna show you some slides that, that basically show the effect of emotion regulating psychotherapies on brain structure and function. Uh, here we're looking at uh, measures of intra-brain connectivity. So um, yellow regions represent um, um, higher intraneuronal connections. And you'll see here that they're involved in cingulate cortex, insular cortex, um, prefrontal cortex. Uh, min again, many of the areas which I showed you in my high-level overview are known to be involved in the regulation, in the generation or the modification of of emotion. Um, another technique going now to the dialectical behavior therapy, uh, we're looking here at gray matter volume in the rostral anterior cingulate cortex and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Again, real estate which is involved in the regulation and generation of emotion. And we'll see that in the dark gray areas, um, individuals who are rehearsing from the DBT manual about mindfulness, and distress tolerance and uh, emotion regulation skills, um, they're building gray matter density in a key brain region. Um, they don't really have any cool, any really cool brain images in this picture, in this in this paper. But the title says says a lot. Um, DBT alters emotion regulation and amygdala activity. Recall the amygdala is part of the limbic circuit, which is largely just devoted to telling the brain. Yes, this is something to be fearful of. Yes, this is something to be angry about. Um, and uh, data show that people with, with um, borderline personality, the quintessential re emotion regulation difficulty, um, have basically overactive amygdalas. 
and overreactive amygdalas. And 12 months of straight up textbook DBT and practice was able to substantially um, reduce amygdala activation and amygdala reactivity. So the more you do it, the better you get. Um, so to summarize, there are um, emotions consist of multiple facets and multiple stages. Most of these facets and stages are entirely modifiable. We can learn about what stage we're in and we can do things about it. Um, human beings have an incredible capacity to learn and change. One thing that people do across the globe all the time is to learn foreign languages. They also learn how to play trumpets and pianos and to, um, and to do ballet. <clears throat> so, and we, can, we, we learn all these things by simply following a program and repeating them and rehearsing them and practicing them. And as we practice a language, <clears throat> we, we rewire our brain, we change connections, we change how the brain works in ways that make that task much easier down the road. Emotion regulation, is no different in essence than learning Spanish. Um, <clears throat> it involves learning how to learn, um, doing exercises and practicing them. And just like learning a language, if we practice, um, if we learn how emotions work and we practice emotion regulation strategies, um, the data that I've just showed you um, uh, shows that we can help clients to better regulate their emotions and in the process are changing changing how their brain works in ways that make that task more easy. So those are the ends of my slides. Um, it, we'll send this out as a PDF. Um, some of these are open access papers. If you want to read more, um, these are all worth, worth the effort.